Hello and welcome to The Long Present, part of the AA's 2021 Summer Public Programme. My name is Shuman Basar and I'll be your host for the next two hours. Thank you for joining us now or indeed later. I'd like to also thank uh, the whole AA team uh, who made this possible to manage a Tom, Joel, Ben, Ryan, Ollie, and, and Bea. I'm told uh, we have a 24 core processor churning away in the background. So hopefully uh, we will not fall victim to technology's cruelty. I've conceived of the long present as a quick, as a set of quick fire encounters with some of the most interesting people I know from different parts of the world and uh, who represent different uh, disciplinary backgrounds. Interspersed is audiovisual content. These provide texture much more than they do any kind of salvational truth. To the right of your screen, you will see the schedule. So tune in, tune out, but stay true to yourself. Um, here is some deep context uh, to why Manage A and I decided to convene with all of you in this way. So where were you in early 2020 when the future seemed to come to an end? Were you at home or in a foreign country? Were you reading Mark Fisher's Ghosts of My Life where he wrote, the slow cancellation of the future has been accompanied by a deflation of expectations. In one very important sense, there is no present to grasp and articulate anymore. By mid-March of that year, the future as we knew it was canceled or postponed, which was the more optimistic word. The present and the future became the same thing. The first pandemic in the advanced social media age had halted vectors of movement, killed supply and demand, and short-circuited our map of measurable distances. Since then, time has felt different. We have been measuring time in statistics and percentages, waves and variant names. I no longer really recall days or weeks. Only months have mental tags now. Only months register as a metric of time. In 2015, Douglas Coupland wrote a piece in the Financial Times called Futurosity. He said, quote, in the past year, it's become impossible to deny that we are living in that far off place we once called the future. And we all know we're inside it too, end quote. He added, quote, is it healthy to live in the future? I try to imagine a world without the present tense, end quote. Now, I'd argue that since the pandemic began, the present has in fact been stretched out. There's the recent present, the extreme present, and the near present. Doesn't everything feel like 10 minutes or 10 years ago? We mostly feel the present, but rarely understand it. It's a secret known by everyone, but comprehended by none. The present works the same way as a joke. The more you try to explain it, the more it falls apart. However, paradoxically, we have also been propelled into simultaneous distant futures with little warning and before we're ready. Futures of work, travel, health, intimacy, and globalization, all time traveled into this new long present. What does it make you feel, think? Do you doomer? Are you for or against Grimes' fully automated luxury communism? On earth, as it is in heaven, which is the next destination her partner, Elon Musk, is heading to, fueled by decentralized Dogecoin derivatives. Satire is a thing of the past, replaced by everyday climate disaster. Fires, floods, infinite feeds. Welcome to la longue durée, long COVID, and red-pilled longueurs. Welcome to the long present. So I'd like to welcome and introduce my first guest, uh, Scott Smith. Scott, are you there? I am here, thank you. Good to see you. Great to see you, Scott. Good afternoon. 
So Scott is founder of Changest. Uh, he's a futures specialist based in the Netherlands, um, in The Hague to be specific. He's also a cultural advisor and author of the book, How to Future, Leading and Sense-Making in an Age of Hyper-Change. Scott consults to a range of NGOs, foundations, and global brands, and lectures at several educational institutes. I know Scott uh, from Dubai and from an infamous, uh, infamous WhatsApp group um, arranged by uh, Dubai's future in chief, Noah Rafford. Uh, Scott, thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon. So Scott, I wanted to start actually with your book, um, mm. How to Future. It came out during that first year of the pandemic, I believe, if I'm right. So could you tell us um, what is it about? Who is it for? Um, and also importantly, has its meaning changed by the context in which it found itself in? Um, so, I mean, the book itself, How to Future, is, it's, is kind of a, I suppose, a, an interesting act of futuring. Um, it was conceived as a, as a sort of handbook, a practical, tactical guide to applied futuring um, and something that people could actually use as a, as a kind of uh, manual or cookbook <laughs> to construct their own futures. And when we uh, spoke to the publisher about it in early 2019, we told them, look, this is a, you know, 2020 will be a good year for, or an interesting year. We didn't say good, but an interesting year for uh, the future. We knew that, you know, Brexit was going to unfold in some fashion, um, multiple major elections around the world. Um, you know, the sort of up, upward sort of slope of climate change. There were a lot of factors that were leading towards it. But of course, we didn't know specifically how the year was going to unfold. And having having said that, it turned out to be kind of the moment for a, a practical manual for how to um, that was designed in a way to um, help people understand how to kind of embody the act of futuring um, and to, to gather a lot of tactical experience on the ground from the past 20 years of our own work to, to sort of translate that for people to help them actually find ways to construct futures themselves. Um, and you know, there's been a lot of kind of abstract methods out there in the world and kind of feel good projections and uh, forecasts, but not a lot of practical advice on how to kind of use your own hands to wrangle the future. Uh, and to try to make something of it. Um, and so that's why we created it. And so when did you, uh, when did you, and, and maybe could you tell us something about your co-author, Madeline Ashby as well? And, and when did you start the, the project? We, it was actually quite a quick project. I mean, you could say we started it 15 years ago because mm -hmm. uh, in some fashion, it really kind of rolls up everything that we had learned from, from doing. Uh, Madeline Ashby, my co-author on the book, uh, is a science fiction writer and futurist um, who specializes more on the kind of narrative side or storytelling side of, of futures. And I had come very much from the sort of, you know, rolled up sleeves, hands on, you know, coal face of trying to deal with complex questions about the future for organizations that have very big risk surfaces. Um, and bringing those two pieces together from our own practice and from teaching, from teaching it in Dubai uh, and other countries and cultures around the world, um, we tried to sort of learn everything we could from that process and roll it into something that was accessible and, um, and pragmatic that really sort of spoke to the, the moment of dealing with the future as it actually happens and not as just some kind of, you know, magic um, uh, kind of magic moment where you grab hold of someone else's forecast and try to write it. And um, I mean, before I, I ask you about um, you know the, the 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 reputation that futurists have um, have uh, you know sort of accrued over the last year, how did the um, I mean when did the book come? It was in the fall. The book came out in September of last year. It was due to come out in July. Mm -hmm. um, but because the future stopped, um, literally because all book selling and production and print ground to a halt in the UK and other parts of the world, um, it sort of got stuck halfway out, out the pipeline into the real world. And, and how, how was the reception when the book 
landed in the in the world and and particularly given these extraordinary um, circumstances under which it, it appeared one of the i guess really challenging moments was we knew what we had put together and we knew that it had real practical application and you know in previous years those show up in different places in different organizations or sort of asking themselves questions about the future but there probably hadn't been a moment when the future sort of stopped as you were describing that it really just kind of hit pause and suddenly everyone was scrambling for some kind of path some some you know orientation and i think one of the the sort of more interesting and tricky parts was having it not available but having people sort of approach us with those kind of problems and issues mm -hmm. um but the reception was actually quite positive um, the, a lot of what we sort of heard was the feedback that it, the, the kind of practicality of it and the plainness of it is something that's often missing in kind of smoke and, you know, flash bang futures, um, where you, you kind of get up on stage at a Ted talk and promise amazing and wonderful things that you don't actually have to deliver. Uh, and in this case, we were dealing with how do you build that and construct it by hand and how do you engage other people with it? And how do you think critically about it, most importantly? And so, yes, so two phrases that I came across in the early phases, phases of the pandemic were uh, narrative collapse, um, which Venkatesh Rao um, wrote about uh, back in March, actually, not, uh, last um, year. And then irreducible uncertainty, which was I heard on, the, on, a, on a BBC uh, World Service um, program about futurists and futurism and the art of prediction. And um, so, Scott, I was wondering, yes, how do you think futurists have fared over the last 18 months? Do you think the field has been validated or even or maybe even devalued? I think it's the field itself or the uh, it's it's even difficult to kind of contain it within the definition of a field, mm -hmm. but as a kind of practice, as a as a, um, a sort of cultural practice, it's really been put to the test. Um, I mean, you mentioned kind of narrative narrative collapse. Mm -hmm. I know we had been using the phrase narrative fracture going back, you know, five or six years in various workshops and discussions with different organizations describing this idea that, you know, in the near future, we could already begin to see the unraveling of things like social contracts and kind of the, the impact or importance of Western canon and all of these different sort of big narratives, political narratives, economic narratives, et cetera. Um, and so it's often difficult to kind of be ahead of that curve and have people listen to you. And then the moment comes. And if you've been doing your work, um, you might have some things and some themes and ideas that, that sort of meet the moment. Um, but that's a real test because it begins to separate the, the sort of futurism, the kind of aesthetic posturing of futurism, of, of projecting, um, you know, weird and wonderful things that are going to occur to all of us in the near future and actually having to kind of grapple with the reality and the details as they present themselves. And that has really kind of separated, I think, um, the, 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 I suppose, the, the kind of cultures or subcultures of futures into the sort of performative and the applied. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen a really interesting thing happen, and that's been a, a, a real surge in interest in how people kind of go back to basics, how organizations in particular go back to basics. And uh, equip themselves to not be fooled again, to 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 sort of see the next one coming. So if you you know do a, a cursory scan of LinkedIn and type in foresight or futures and jobs, you will start seeing new organizations launching new divisions, new organiza new new teams, new practices, and kind of gearing themselves up for something that they haven't been doing really for the past few decades. So that sort of grappling with reality element of it, I think, has been quite noticeable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, projects just kind of going back to basics and trying to establish baselines and uh, kind of starter scenarios that we can kind of work by has been really, really remarkable um, just kind of see that happen. Um, and I think people are beginning to get past this idea of uncertainty as something they can reduce or kind of box in or eliminate and begin to realize that this is something that's not going away. And so we have to think about it differently. And you have this, you, you have verbed 
the word future, I believe. Uh, you talk about future ink. Could you, could you tell us a little bit what you mean, mean by that word? By that? Yeah, I think it's, it, it was a way of expressing how we do our own work. This isn't something that we sort of go to the, to the office nine to five, you know, with an hour lunch break and then go home and forget about. Um, when, when for, for many of us who do this work full time, it's a 24 seven kind of, it's a, a, you know, something that's kind of wired into your brain. Mm -hmm. It's an embodied behavior. You're always looking, uh, noticing, processing, sense making, and uh, making choices. So we wanted to express that idea of it being uh, an embodied act and practice, not just a separate um, sort of professional activity that has a kind of cost code and a um, uh, you know a separate line item with it. Um, and I think that's been something people have really begun to take on board that it's you need to always be noticing, always be aware and um, making those kinds of decisions and thinking scenarically on an ongoing basis. And so that's why we chose the sort of the verb form. Mm -hmm. And um, um, my next question is, uh, is asking you to, to, to speculate. Um, <laughs> uh, because one of the things that, you know, the last 18 months felt like was a kind of planetary beta testing. Uh, in how we work, we love, we travel, um, don't travel. Uh, also, indeed, how we even perceive reality. Um, and uh, and I'm wondering, Scott, in your own opinion, um, what do you think are the changes that are most likely to stay in the in the near future? And I say this um, having just in the last few days, um, we're seeing very large companies. Um, uh, not necessarily renege, but seemingly uh, at least shuffle backwards from an impression that they gave uh, a, num a number of months ago, which was that, you know, working from home or, or this blended working or et cetera, you know, the idea of 100% office occupancy was a thing of the past, you know. And now we're seeing large companies saying, no, sorry, you know, we're going to we expect, we, we expect you back. You know, so it, it, I guess we're we're uh, we're obviously also in a and and that's why my next guest is from from Goa from India. So we're going to have a very different view. We're 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 living in extremely disaggregated version of the present and and the future. And so, um, but but yes, yeah, Scott, I'm I'm curious from your perspective. Um, what do you think are some of the these some of these like um, shock changes that we experience that you think are here to are here to stay in some form or another. Well, I mean, indeed, a lot of narratives have been blown up. Um, a lot of the kind of norms that people have come to expect have, have sort of, you just sort of see the dissolve in front of us. And, you know, one of the questions we were kind of getting frequently um, last spring and into summer was, okay, when is this going to end and how? So we can just get back to, to business. We can get back to, to whatever their sort of normal behavior was. Um, and then you see this kind of, um, marketing of new normal is an idea um, that, well, will change, but we'll change to this other fixed state. Um, it will shift from this to this, but that will have some level of stability to it. And I think our kind of assumption has been since quite early on is that the, the um, you use the word shock, you know, that this kind of um, on, on off state of flux is actually this is it. We're actually, we're, we're existing in the sort of end state right now for the moment, for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. The idea that there's kind of ons and offs that you can fly, not fly, meet, not meet, masks up, masks down, um, two vaccines, three vaccines, you know, booster shots, et cetera. Um, that, that kind of um, state of not necessarily uncertainty, but almost kind of binary or, or trinary sort of you know, switching, I think, is is sort of the state we were going to find ourselves in. I sat down to write an essay about that in January and stopped because um, sort of second wave was really hitting and that caused a lot of things to change. And I could never get back to to, to writing it because the, the situation kept shifting. Um, you know, the North is now learning to live as the South has for for decades and generations, power cuts, um, massive floods. If you look at Germany right now, this is nothing that Bangladesh hasn't experienced, um, you know, throughout the 20th century and before um, that uh, we're, we're seeing dynamics kind of move around 
but um, the instability is the sort of uh, the I guess the the sort of standard at this point. Uh, people want continuity return. They want their neighbors to to want the same as they do. You expect governments will protect you uh, and not harm you. Um, as you said, questioning reality, <laughs> the fact that we can actually begin to sort of settle into um, the the kind of operating of multiple realities in the kind of common space is bizarre, but but happening. Um, so I think uh, you know we're having to learn to to make futures in small batches as we go and sort of lay track. I think that's again back to the idea of kind of it being an embodied, applied, pragmatic way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. There is no fifty year future that's not going to get disrupted. Um, you really have to learn to sort of think combinatorially, think scenarically in multiple narratives at the same time and become really, really good at hedging risk on a kind of personal basis. Amazing. And Scott, uh, very last uh, uh, quick question uh, before we, we, we move on. Has there been a, a book or a film or some cultural, um, some, you know, some cultural artifact that you find yourself returning to? over the last uh, 18 months that gave you some kind of solace or, or navigation uh, through the unexpected kind of times? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tricky one. I think I've never consumed so much media uh, and so much culture as I have in the past year and really kind of been weeding through it in, in part to kind of look for fragments of narratives that can be useful, but also maybe, maybe personally kind of deep inside looking for that. Um, and I don't think I've, I've necessarily kind of found it as much, but I have I have kind of found an appreciation for um, we were just in Dubai, for example, where we spent a lot of the past few years and an appreciation not so much for the kind of shiny new elements of it, but for the kind of eternal deep cultural aspects of it and how they express themselves and the things that are very still um, in the middle of constant motion and erosion. Um, and I haven't really found a story that that kind of embodies that so much as just spaces and places, I think. Beautiful. Scott, thank you so much for your time. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, I couldn't have um, begun this, uh, this, uh, this event with anyone uh, better than, than yourself. So take really care, take care in, uh, over in The Hague and uh, <laughs> hope to see you soon. Same to you and everybody else. Bye, Bye. for now. Bye for now. Okay, so many history books of the 20th century mark October 1917 as one of the most significant turning points, giving rise, of course, to the Soviet Union. It's a date that is bracketed by its subsequent, by the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, somewhere between 1989 and 1991. Less evidently marked is July the 1st, 1921 the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, who, unlike the Soviet model of socialism, continues to thrive, and whose geopolitical power has been notably boost, boosted and bolstered by the pandemic. As Charlie Robin Jones told me right at the beginning, historically speaking, plagues signal the end of empires, or indeed the birth of new ones. The, CC, the CCP plans the future in five year stretches. The One Belt, One Road project will be, if fully implemented, the largest infrastructure project that has ever happened. A 21st century redux of the Chinese Silk Road, which was arguably the very birth of the internet well over a thousand years ago. I'd like to share some footage whose title is, quote, Celebrations of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China were held on the 1st of July, 2021 in Beijing to celebrate the centennial of the founding of the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, which has been the sole governing political party of the People's Republic of China since 1949. The text that you see overlaid comes from a famous disquisition on memory and time. Please can we roll the first interlude film.
I welcome back everybody. I'd like to introduce my next guest, Sky Arundhati Thomas. Sky is a writer based in Goa, India, and was recently appointed editor of the White Review. Sky also writes for countless um, titles, um, but also I think most notably for our discussion for the London Re Review of Books. Hi, Sky. Hi. Uh, we were, yes, we were just saying what a wonderful color background you have there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're clearly a pro Zoomer. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yes, Sky, I thought I, I wanted to start our conversation really around these set of dispatches that you um, produced um, over the uh, pandemic period um, uh, for the London Review books, um, which I think, you know, were read by very, very many people and I think have formed a very important corpus of of, um, uh, of of sort of tracking how uh, how the the pandemic um, sort of filters into very specific geopolitical conditions, geocultural conditions. Um, so back in April 2020, um, uh, Arundhati Roy wrote, I think, also a very um, uh, formative, um, but also um, um, uh, it was, a, it was a piece for the Financial Times that I think resonated with a lot of people immediately. Again, at that, at that time when we had all, or many of us had collectively gone into a state of lockdown. And she described uh, the pandemic as a portal. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in my memory, there was a hint of optimism, hint of optimism, although of course, um, uh, 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 couched and cradled in, a, a huge amount of criticism, of course, as is as is as is what Arundhati Roy uh, is is well known for. Um, but however, we've seen in India, um, I think the the kind of political instrumentalization of the pandemic, um, uh, particularly for the interests uh, the furthering of the of the of the BJP. Um, so you 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 wrote a number of these pieces. You wrote about caste atrocities, uh, the farmers' protests and the chronic shortage of oxygen. Um, and so in that sense, the, it seemed to me that the pandemic uh, seems to be less of a portal to an other, another or an other future, a more a kind of hyper compounding of what is already there. Um, now, I, I wanted to ask you just to get things going, looking back on those pieces that you wrote, which, and again, I, if, I'm, if I'm correct, um, uh, appear in the in the in that part of the of the London Review of Books, which has a kind of diary feel to it as a sense of like again recording time as it's happening. Um, what were you trying to frame and what were you trying to convey um, with those with those pieces, those dispatches? Mm, well thank you for reading them. Um, I guess what happened what, what I guess COVID or essentially the pandemic within an Indian context um, hap, uh, like arrives um, around like a, a very intense nexus of violence and, and yes, like state perpetuated or kind of sanctioned violence. Um, and as the Arunathi Roy piece also gets into is, you know, we have um, kind of Donald Trump state visit, um, which is happening around the same time as this kind of pogrom rages through Northeast Delhi um, where, you know, Muslims in particular were um, very brutally, kind of very violently assaulted. Um, and the anti-citizenship movement that had really kicked off in 2019, well, towards the end of 2019, was rapidly being, well, quite literally erased, um, where, you know, 24-hour sit-in sites and kind of these amazing sites of congregation that happened in, in public space were you know, one of the first things that happened when the lockdown was declared was that state officials went in and destroyed protest sites and painted over walls. Um, and so to, to look at the pandemic within that kind of uh, very chaotic nexus is also to see that um, we were dealing with one crisis after the next, probably, I mean, arguably since Modi's kind of election in 2014, but um, you know, we had the uh, the intensified military occupation of Kashmir in August, um, and then the, the the announcement of the new citizenship bills, the protest movement, and then 
um, the, the Delhi riots and then the pandemic. So it was kind of um, surreal. <laughs> um, and I had up until then, you know, mostly been kind of writing within the arts and and it's interesting you you speak of pandemic as a portal and and you know while I really appreciate that piece for developing quite a rich context around um, how COVID arrived, I had also found myself increasingly frustrated with metaphors mm-hmm. and um, increasingly frustrated with kind of big rhetorical arguments. I guess because often, particularly for an international press, when um, dispatches are being sent from, you know, India or maybe South Asia more broadly, the, the, there's these, always these kind of big rhetorical arguments and these big metaphors. And I just kind of wanted to make records that were um, um, in, in some senses trying to collage or, or, or gather events uh, in ways that people could see things uh, in ways that they connect without, you know, any kind of hyperbole in some, some way. Um, so, I, I mean, some of the pieces I would, I would finish them and I would reread them and think, I, you know, anyone reading this is going to think I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist or something. Cause why? there's why? so why? much, uh, so for instance, I wrote about the incarceration of uh, a group of young activists. Um, you know, the news started coming in that, the, um, that the New Delhi police and, and kind of the central government were reframing what was essentially a nonviolent protest movement as being orchestrated by a group of um, students and activists, uh, a number of whom were charged with, you know, pro- probably the most severe um, uh, uh, sections of the Indian Penal Code and the Unlawful Activities Prote- Pre- Prevention Act that, um, you know, any nation state could levy against its own citizens. So. Um, students were charged with uh, aggravated assault, destruction of public property, um, the manufacture and sale of arms, um, you know, fundraising for rioting. And um, at the very same time, the farmers' protests were actually beginning in September and labor laws had, had been gone in and changed in, a, in an empty parliament because the opposition had gone on strike over them. And at the same time, you know, the media was kind of hyper focused on the suicide of the young Bollywood actor and, you know, his alleged drug abuse. Um, And so I tried to put everything together so that we could kind of see that ecosystem and the ways in which our attention was being diverted in certain ways or um, how things linked up. And and yeah, sometimes it can it can be really overwhelming to try to grapple with that um, level of chaos, I guess. And, and you mentioned that you mentioned um, this business of writing for an international audience, mm. um, and presumably, you know, in terms of um, you know your your mindset, how you frame things, is it markedly different than if you were to write in a Indian title or for an in- Indian media? How conscious is that um, gear shifting for you? Yeah, I think I'm definitely more critical uh, and, and I have that um, comfort or security of, of knowing that potentially the, the big BJP troll armies aren't going to uh, read the LRB, at least World Touch Word, not yet. Um, although I do get some kind of aggressive DMs once in a while. Um, so there is like a, definitely a sense of safety uh, and I do appreciate that. Uh, and I know, you know, journalists much more prolific than me have also um, appreciated this. And I guess I don't necessarily um, change the argument, but I am cognizant that a lot of the complexity has to be fleshed out in ways that are understandable and in some ways, you know, translated to a, a wider audience that might not be kind of clued in. Um, to, to, to the tiny details. And I think I am more, you know, kind of obsessed with the tiny details now um, than, than before, uh, because they seem to, to bring to life the kind of severity um, of what's going on. So I think it's more, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, you know, particular attention to, attention to language, also um, in some senses like narrative as well. Um, I want the reader to stay with me until the end of the piece and not feel overwhelmed. 
um, and also, you know, potentially find it relatable or uh, insightful in some way. Thank you. So, Sky, I was, you know, I told you in our preparation that I wanted to ask you about so-called Indian futurism because I, I didn't, I don't even know what that possibly could be. But you told me quite in quite forthright terms, which I appreciated, uh, that you no longer feel invested in the future. Um, now, could you tell us why this is the case? Um, and how does your forthcoming book uh, or essay length book, Everything Will Be Remembered, fit into this sense of being liberated from the future? Mm. Um, I guess, so I started writing about the protest movement in this kind of long essay. Um, as soon as I noticed that, you know, not only were the visible traces um, of the movement being kind of erased, uh, the, you know, our leaders are kind of, you know, revolutionaries incarcerated and so not, no longer able to hold public discourse, uh, you know, being literally taken out of um, uh, society and, and, and put into prison. Um, but then also this kind of huge propaganda effort to um, rewrite the nonviolent protest movement as, as a kind of plot, um, you know, like a corrupt plot. Um, and so I started by, you know, initially making records and trying to stay with a, a, a series of images that I feel, you know, changed mainstream consciousness or at least a certain kind of leftist consciousness within uh, India. And, and one of them is a photo of, of Chandrasekhar Azad holding up a copy of the Indian constitution at the Jama Masjid in, in Delhi. Um, and the copy of the constitution that he's holding is a photo of uh, the revolutionary leader uh, B.R. Ambedkar on it. And I guess that movie for me, that, sorry, that photo for me seemed to collapse um, a lot of kind of symbolic significance. And, and part of it was to turn to our constitution primarily as an anti-caste document, as a document that argued towards like a total um, secular secularism. And the constitution is often enshrined within a decolonial kind of post-colonial rhetoric as part of the Nehruvian um, agenda. And I guess it just made me cognizant of the fact that growing up in India in the ways that I did in, this, in the class and caste position that I did, um, we grew up almost like being taught or conditioned to desire the future in a very intense way, mm -hmm. where we were sold this like solid rhetoric of progress and, um, and, and you know, uh, that the things were changing, that we were kind of moving towards a, a different reality. And um, the Modi regime, when it came to power in 2014, it, it almost accelerated that rhetoric of progress by, you know, the, the phrase was Ache bin Ani Wali hai, which is the good days are coming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was the, the, again, this like promise for this, this abstraction, which was the future was what everyone had to hold on to. And in some ways, revisiting the, the Nehruvian legacy um, within the Indian context and thinking through the kind of modernist utopianisms that were, um, you know, both kind of aesthetically and, you know, politically with, with the non-alignment movement or, um, you know, ideologically instilled. Um, I think what happened is that these kind of, you know, socialist utopianisms were an attempt to hold an impossible thing. Um, and, you know, the, the collapse of the non-alignment movement is quite, you know, in a remarkable um, moment of this in global history where so many post-colonial nation states that were, you know, kind of moving towards this future suddenly no longer could. Um, and so I, I almost find myself resisting the future in a way to pay uh, a much more focused attention to the present. Mm -hmm. So I really like this long present. Um, and also to see that, you know, the, the kind of, uh, even if I take the protest movement or even the, you know, Islamophobic or casteist violence that we were seeing a very accelerated version of now, it's not without pre precedent. Um, the kind of violent, like, you know, very violent communal history of India is, is not something that kind of has happened in the last, you know, even 50 decades. There is about 2000 years of this. 
Um, and I think what this um, obsession with the future and, you know, this is just me in my early stages of kind of thinking through this. So I hope it doesn't sound too flippant. Um, and I'm still maybe being a bit kind of naive and vulnerable and thinking, through, thinking it through. But I feel it was an attempt to cover up the violence of the past. It was an attempt to you know, uh, think that we could move on from the violence of the past. And because we haven't reckoned with it, now we're here. Um, where the future that never arrived uh, is the one that we're living and everything is bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. um, and so I use this poem by Amir Aziz um, as the title of, of, of the essay, which is, um, you know, Sab Yadra Ka Jaiga, which kind of went, you know, viral and, and I guess gave so many of us hope because it said everything will be remembered. Mm. Um, once again, imagining a future in which things would be different. And I guess I want to maybe turn that around and, and think about, you know, how do we work towards a different present um, and potentially also look at the past very differently. I mean, I'm glad you men mentioned the word progress because... I mean, I think some of the greatest acts of civilizational violence have been done in the name of progress, ultimately. And um, it's interesting, I was listening to something recently, that it was a history of the World Fair and, and of Expo and this kind of thing, and, and said that, you know, there's, there's a turning point, and it's somewhere in the 60s and the 70s, where the idea of progress um, becomes, um, you know, it, it switches from being something positive to something negative, right? And, um, but then by the end of the 20th century and in the 21st century, you, you see the uptake by, you know, the, the rising economies and whether it's China or the, or the Middle East or indeed India um, now take on the baton of this, this notion of progress. And so whether it's the return of the, you know, of, 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 of the new space race um, Arabs to Mars, or you know, I know India has also a very active space program. Um, so I think this, the, the, the you know, the um, that the, the the sort of valency of progress, uh, I think, is very very important. Sky, before we we have to kind of um, move on, I wanted to ask you very quickly: Has there been a book or a film or some cultural artifact from the past that you found yourself turning to as a talisman um, over the last year or so? Mm, I mean, I've been uh, reading very, very slowly uh, Svetlana Aleksevich's Voices from Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I read it so sparingly because I also don't want to feel like hooked to it in that in that like thirsty way that kind of episodes of trauma can invoke in us sometimes. Um, but really kind of sit with each um, chapter and 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 I and I guess that's where my you know my my desire to make records from has, has really also come through, um, you know. And yeah, I think I think that's what it is. And and I think w with regards to progress as well, you know, Chernobyl in in a way mm -hmm. is is another kind of violent eruption of of, um, of a failed dream of un go unquote progress. And I think um, we see a lot of those here. Um, uh, so, yeah. Sky, thank you so much for your time. I know it's the evening that there in, in Goa. Um, I hope to see you uh, in the flesh uh, at some point <laughs> soon. Um, have a really lovely evening. And from all of us, thank you. Uh, thank bye, you so bye much. For now. Bye yeah. for now. Yeah. Okay. Take bye. care. Autonomous sensory meridian response is a tingling sensation that typically begins on the scalp and moves down the back of the neck and upper spine. It's also a hugely popular genre on YouTube with billions of views and millions of bewilderingly niche categories. So if you're feeling anxious about the long present so far, here's some relaxing ASMR about time. Can we please have the second interlude next? Thank you. Well, hello there. Welcome to the Time Travel Hotel. It is 
so wonderful to have a VIP client such as yourself staying with us this evening. Have you, have you been here before or is this going to be your first time at the hotel? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you are going to absolutely love it. It is an experience that is fully custom tailored to your needs and wishes and absolutely designed individually for you to have the best, most restful and fulfilling sleep. I'm gonna go ahead and get you all checked in and then we're going to design your experience for this evening and see where you would like to travel to. Now the floor and the room number will be determined based on the time period of your choosing. Before we get into any of that, I'm just going to go ahead and fill out your basic information and then from there we will go on to finding the perfect room for you, for your experience. Okay, now Welcome back, time travelers. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce my next uh, guest, Simon Denny. Simon makes exhibitions that unpack uh, social and political implications of the technology industry and the rise of social media, startup culture, blockchains, and cryptocurrencies. He co-founded the Artist Mentoring Program, Berlin Program for Artists, and serves as professor at the Hochschule für Bildung Kunst in Hamburg. Uh, Simon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, uh, Shumon. It's been a wonderful program so far. I've been uh, watching along. Uh, a real pleasure. And uh, everybody needs to know that we're almost neighbors. Uh, we could probably <laughs> shout at each other through the... Uh, Simon's on the 18th floor. I'm, I'm here on the 11th floor in Berlin. Um, so Simon, I thought we'd start with some of your most recent work, uh, which was uh, shown at your New York gallery, Petzl Gallery, under the title um, Mine. Uh, and so if you could tell us uh, what was contained in it, what was it about and how you got your message across, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, yeah, mine has actually been a kind of a, a longer project um, that started uh, a number of years ago. Um, and it sort of brought together a number of different interests of mine looking at, yeah, the things you mentioned in my bio. Um, it started in Australia um, and it also started with me um, reading uh, and uh, listening to uh, a couple of thinkers I really like, Big Fourth and Vlad and Jola, who put out this um, uh, uh, anatomy of an AI system uh, diagram, uh, which I found so uh, compelling. Um, and this is a vision of it in the first iteration of mine uh, in Australia. And yeah, I'm just going to read a little section um, that, uh, that Kate and Bludden wrote that uh, helped kind of shape my thinking around it. They say it's necessary to move beyond a simple analysis of, um, oh, sorry, uh, I'm just trying to, yeah. Uh, a simple analysis of the relationship between individual humans, uh, their data, and any single technology company in order to contend with truly planetary scale of extraction. There are deep interconnections between the literal hollowing out of the materials of the earth and biosphere and the data capture and monetization of human practices and communication and sociality. Thinking about extraction requires thinking about labor, resources, and data together. And this presents a challenge to critical and popular understandings of artificial intelligence. It's hard to see any of these processes individually, uh, let alone collectively, hence the need for 
a visualization that can bring all these connected but globally dispersed processes into a single map. Now that was them describing their project and why they did it. But for me, it also kind of spoke to this challenge, I think for artists that work in this space is how do you kind of help, um, I guess like make it possible to feel these processes. And, um, and one of the things that I've been looking at recently uh, spurred on by that is, um, is patent designs. Um, so kind of claims on intellectual property in the future of, uh, of machinery by large technology companies. Um, and this is a sculpture I made uh, that was based on um, a pat patent uh, that is uh, filed by Amazon. Um, for a delivery drone. So this is like the drawing that it's based on um, just last year, actually. Um, and it's a kind of an interesting thing because it, yeah, it literally is a machine that replaces workers, obviously, uh, workers that have been highly visible during the pandemic. Um, and uh, yeah, it's something that is like a flying drone that delivers goods directly to consumers, but it has this kind of bulbous, um, uh, yeah, eruption out the top of it, which is like a hot air balloon. Um, so it's this interesting for me because the symbology of it was like, oh, wow, it's like an Amazon uh, delivery drone Zeppelin, you know? Uh, so it's this kind of dystopic, you know, future of, of, of where these things might go. And uh, in that spirit, I was sort of thinking and looking around how Amazon and extraction are linked at a kind of deeper level. Um, and I just want to play this little bit of an ad, um, which is talking about how, how great... Um, uh, this mining company is um, that Amazon worked with. Oh, no, wait, let me just play this first. This is Amazon, one of Amazon's ads for um, AWS, which is a data product that they use, um, uh, which just shows you a little bit. Everything here is big. Yeah, so th that just shows you uh, a little bit of the frame that Amazon has for their big data services, uh, which they do in conglomeration with um, this other company called Rio Tinto, uh, which is one of the big uh, mining companies um, uh, based in Australia and, uh, and Great Britain. Right way, and to keep learning, taking our company and the industry forward. In 2001, we were a founding member of the International Council on Mining and Metals, giving the industry a collective voice and enabling it to identify, share and develop solutions to complex challenges. In 2002, we were the first mining company listed on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and in 2010, we issued our inaugural award-winning taxes paid report, a step change in voluntary reporting, and part of our ongoing commitment to be a transparent and responsible business. But there will always be more that we can do better. The world today is constantly changing and we will need to evolve to meet the challenges ahead. And I was just like totally uh, blown away by this, um, this image that you just saw of this rock of, the, of an earth. So among claims to transparency and, uh, you know, uh, sustainability and all these things, there was this kind of version of the globe, which was literally just the mineable earth, um, which is their product. And so I created an app um, which uh, goes along with the sculpture where you can kind of see that emerge um, over the top. And it's an animation of a spinning globe, which is only rocks. As if the earth is like one giant mineable mine. Yeah, so that gives you a, a kind of a, a sense of that um, artwork, uh, which was like formed, uh, you know, the core of um, that exhibition. Um, uh, but that wasn't the only way I was looking at um, uh, extraction uh, through these kinds of imagery. Um, it was, uh, I released my show at the same time as there was this kind of spike in interest around crypto hype, which is something that I've been interested in for a really long time. And so um, I was also thinking about mining in other senses, like data mining, obviously with this um, Amazon work, but also uh, crypto mining. Um, and these miners also, these machines um, that do that work. Um, and uh, I, uh, I worked with an illustrator um, uh, who does uh, game illustration to commission a kind of a, a portrait of uh, a couple of very specific miners uh, that I bought off um, eBay. Um, and the price of these things had spiked uh, during the kind of crypto boom of the first part of uh, you know, March and April. Um, uh, because it was suddenly profitable to use them again. Um, but also uh, big questions were being asked and good questions were being asked about um, environmental impacts of the, the processing power used of these things. Um, and in kind of playing with that idea, I thought uh, as an NFT, would it not be interesting to kind of put all these packages in as one and uh, take these mining units off the blockchain network 
and instead um, give their computing power to help uh, model uh, climate um, stuff that was going on instead. So it was going out of the system as I was putting something else into it, like a portrait of it into it. Um, and yeah, we, uh, we, I mentioned these uh, NFTs um, uh, on SuperRare, um, which is one of the platforms that have been around uh, and kind of growing this bizarre hype in, uh, in NFTs. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just uh, an example of, of, of the kind of digital asset that ended up um, as that as well. Ending up with that same uh, imagery from Rio Tinto. So, um, yeah, maybe that gives you a, a little bit of a, a start to what was going on um, with my uh, show there. That's great. Thank you. It's funny when you were, when you were showing the Amazon, uh, you know, uh, marketing uh, material, it made me think of, you know, these fictional companies in Blade Runner or an alien, like Ridley Scott was very good at this, I think. And of course, Stanley Kubrick. Um, although I think in 2001, it's interesting because you, you, you actually have IBM. Um, so right. it's, it's less of a kind of fictional, it's more the fictionalizing of actual companies. But you know, you have Way Wayland, um, Wayland Industries and all these kind of things, right? So, and, yeah. um, but it's fascinating because it's like, you could almost drop um, Amazon um, marketing videos <laughs> into a sci-fi and it's, yeah. you know, they are one of, they are that, they are that fictional company. It seems to me, right. That, that we've been warned about for so long, um, right. uh, over 50 years of science fiction at least. And, um, but in, I mean, of course there are very, very many people who have deep issues with Amazon and of course refuse to engage with it or engage with it by resisting it and by, you know, holding it accountable but there are also many, many people who simply uh, could not, and particularly during the pandemic, particularly during lockdown, could probably not, you know, um, whose everyday life would not be possible without the science fiction right. realism of, of what Amazon brings us. And I think it's also fascinating, isn't it? Because we, we keep thinking of Amazon as a, in the same way we think of Google, most as though it's still just a search engine, but in reality, that's just literally the tip of the tip of the iceberg, isn't it? And, and the reality of these companies is, is inconceivable, probably. I mean, even to themselves, maybe. And, um, and so I think also this notion of like mining into what the company is, right? Like is also another way we can think about mining uh, or kind of mining um, the, the, the actuality of, uh, of, of these, these corporate beer moths that somehow either get, they seem to be shorthanded between the very first thing that they set themselves up to do. And of course, their, you know, their enigmatic, charismatic uh, leader figure, which I, I would like to get to in, 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 a, in, in this moment, actually. So I know you've been interested in the personalities that head big tech. And yeah. in, our, in our new book, um, uh, The Extreme Self, which um, you're, you're part of, uh, which I've, I've written with Hansrik Obris and Douglas Coupland, uh, we call these tech overlords technologians. Uh, and we say that they're a new kind of magic individual. How do you think they have fared during the pandemic? And is there any turning back from these figures? Because they are absolutely no different to these uh, demagogic figures that you do see in Blade Runner and you do see in Alien, for example. Yeah, except that, you know, maybe the fictional versions are less uh, challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, they're, it's, more, uh, they're, they're more morally black and white, aren't they? In a way. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, you know, I think obviously, like, it's hard to come past the pandemic period without thinking of, uh, you know, the boost in power, the boost in. Uh, uh, in accumulation, the boost in visibility also of, of figures like that, particularly Musk. I mean, yeah. he's like uh, become so visible and then in this really incredible way, kind of um, being so directly linked to movements of markets, popular, you know, popular uh, sentiment turning into uh, what's referred to as meme stock manipulation and his associating with cryptocurrencies like 
you know, Dogecoin and, and, uh, and the attention economies that are becoming tied to more tangibly uh, abstracted assets um, in that way. Um, so, uh, you know, I think perhaps that's the, for me, the, the larger story in terms of the evolution of the visibility and impact of those kind of characters as rhetorical devices at, you know, while humans themselves and power brokers themselves also as kind of uh, containers for um, attention grabbing and, you know, more and more directly uh, monetization. And I think that's one of what the, um, one of what the uh, NFT spike moments really demonstrated very clearly uh, to me as well as a, as an observer and participant, um, uh, just how much, uh, you know, capturing value and more directly putting it into abstractable assets that, you know, that infrastructure is becoming. Right. Um, so when uh, like, you know, likes are a kind of, you know, an attention through, you know, web 2.0 mm -hmm. uh, platforms are a kind of a, uh, capital that you can cash in on, right? That, that, but there's a few steps in between. You can't, you know, take your likes directly and uh, turn them into a, a financial product and swap them for something else, right? Or leverage them against something else. But with with 3.0, uh, and I think you know, with Musk via Dogecoin via the meme stocks, you can kind of see that kind of drifting towards that area. Um, that will be more and more possible, and this kind of embeddedness of our own attention value to direct abstractions representing capital is going to just get closer and closer. So that's, um, I don't know, that's an answer, but yeah, yeah, something yeah, yeah. dominating my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah fascinating. Um, uh, Simon, we, so we spoke like this in a similar event that I organized back in March, 2020, which was called uh, Do You Story? And um, uh, we were, at that point, I think we were, uh, we discussed the financial markets as a way of tracking shock at that at that time, I think. And I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, what has evolved from that moment to right now that you perhaps didn't see coming? And, um, and then maybe a little bit more specifically, when it comes to change, do you think mm -hmm. we will see any system, systemic change to the art world or, or not? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, which is a bit hard to answer still. Um, yeah. I still feel like we're in the middle of something and maybe it'll, it's something we'll never come to an end of. But yeah. uh, certainly in this, what has been kind of treated as a, as a kind of a temporary phase, you know, uh, which I don't know if it actually is a temporary phase or not. Um, there has already been a reshuffle in my own activities and my activity partners and like who I'm in touch with and why. Um, and that is so much the fabric of the infrastructure of the art world as it stands. So um I think with that change uh, in, you know, whom, whom one's in touch with and how um, and what becomes visible, again, kind of, I guess, filtering back to this uh, acknowledgement of attention being so uh, valuable, um, uh, that I think a, a reshuffle of which actors do what in the art world and certainly where capital goes in the art world has become really clear. Again, to shine the light back on the NFT moment um, for, actors like uh, Sotheby's and Christie's to go, you know, directly into, I guess, partnership with people who are very wealthy in the, in the crypto world uh, and perform these auctions um, as a kind of, you know, that essentially do a number of things. Um, they uh, both, you know, brands like that are not only capital generating engines, but they're also legitimacy lending engines, right, as well. So, you know, if something happens at Sotheby's and Christie's, it's a little different than it happened somewhere else in the art world um, because they're such uh, venerable brands and they, they capture so much of the wealth, but also of the, um, yeah, legitimizing stamp. Um, so I was, you know, I think the, the kind of people moment looks a little bit like an anomaly, maybe still now, but I, I wonder as temporary as this time experience is, uh, will some of those things that sort of seemed like anomalies uh, in the space of something could have only happened under those conditions, uh, will, it, will it continue in that way? I guess those are the questions that I'm left with. Fantastic. Simon, um, we've run out of time. As ever, it's a pleasure to, to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, bye for now and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shimon. I, I can't wait to see the rest of the program. Yeah, cheers. Take care. So one of the other things that were put, hold, put on hold over the last uh, year or so were fashion shows and fashion weeks.
Instead, labels pivoted to recorded content, or in the case of Balenciaga, a quasi-video game. It's brought about a new period of experimentation in fashion films. A recent example of this is Pearl Parts of Me, directed by BAFTA-nominated director Akinola Davis Jr. to accompany Priya Aluwalia's collaboration with Mulberry. The music is by Kelly Moran, and visual design is by Cream Projects, who we will meet straight after we've seen the film, which is an ode to black hair and Aluwalia's mixed Indian-Nigerian heritage. Uh, could we please play interlude number three? Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so I'd like to welcome and introduce my next guest, um, Anna and Seb from Cream Projects. Uh, Cream Projects is a world building and digital arts studio based in London with a focus on game engine technologies. They collaborate with artists, designers, research agencies and institutions to build worlds and create original content using computer generated imagery. Hi, Anna and Seb, greetings. Hello. Hello. Thanks so much for joining us. So the, the background I'd like to um, conduct our conversation, our discussion around is this notion that over the last 18 months, uh, one of the things that's been accelerated or as it were been brought forward from the future to the present is this idea that second life, which if anyone's old enough to remember will we'll know it was one of the very relatively early um, um, online um, virtual uh, world um, uh, filled with avatars, its own currency, a sort of proto cryptocurrency. How, uh, but that term second life has increasingly become our first life. And what the implications are, therefore, of world building and indeed world inhabiting. Um, so we just saw this uh, beautiful film that uh, you worked on um, called Parts of Me. Um, so maybe uh, it would be great to hear you introduce who those protagonists were and what your role in the uh, in the film and uh, and indeed that world building was as a way for us to to hear more about what Cream Projects does and and what you're about. Hi, thanks for having us. It's been great so far. Um, so I mean, we can talk about how um, this project came about. Um, we were invited by Akinola Davies, who's now a friend and good collaborator, to work on this kind of never seen before um, campaign and film uh, for Awalia. Um, and he is really, really kind of interested in virtual production and um, computer generated imagery. Uh, so he got us on board for this. Um, what we've put together, we put together a presentation that kind of um, points at different things that around world building. So um, maybe it's best if we share the screen now and then good. we can go through that. Okay. Um, screen two. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, I guess with, with this project, we um, kind of worked on uh, a series of environments that uh, were in response to um, obviously the the uh, creative director Priya, um, who is basically the, the brains behind uh, Aluwalia, as well as um, the set designers, uh, Studio Augmenta, um, the director Akinola Davis Jr., and the DOP uh, uh, Zenia Patricia, that really kind of uh, brought together all these kind of uh, different fields of expertise uh, into making this a reality. Um, so, if you look at this image, uh, the the kind of involvement that we had in, in kind of creating it is the backdrop. So essentially, it was this kind of hybrid reality set up um, with the talent, obviously, in the real world, and then our worlds as kind of backdrops. Um, obviously, with the set by Studio Menta and the wonderful clothes um, that were there. 
um, to go further into this. I mean, this was the first project we worked on with such a big crew. Um, and again, pointing maybe at world building is that I guess these were all the world builders um, that that were involved. I mean, from the hair, makeup, um, to, uh, I don't know, the model wrangler, which we just found out what that means. It's a really interesting uh, job. Um, and, and so we were a very, very small part in making this happen. Um, and to speak further to that, I guess we were also a very, very small part in this pool of references that were sent to us and they were kind of talking through with um, with Akinola, with Studio Menta and the director of photography. So in the kind of early stages, when we kind of, let's say, like drew the kind of boundaries of the world, um, we started from a lot, a lot of images coming from um, various kind of uh, fields. Yeah. You know what I add to that? No, I mean, I guess, um, I guess, you know, just to kind of, uh, elaborate on that a little bit more like the like we always kind of start with visual material um you know and and i think this is like a crucial part of the process that like really needs to kind of get defined quite early on um what we don't like and what we like um and then you know obviously moving into the next step of um actually materializing some of these things into uh real uh cgi environments that um will kind of obviously show um yeah so this is one of the uh kind of um images we sent to to priya and akin once we got into the world building in in the kind of game engine and what we really like about this slide and we keep showing it is um the kind of amount of iteration that we could do and kind of almost like rehearse these worlds and kind of test test these worlds with um with the team um, and to kind of like also test, you know, things like atmosphere and sun and the water and all these kind of little elements in this kind of abstracted image became really, really important. Um, but then, you know, when we went on set, it, it kind of became clear that the world building was not stopping in our kind of like screen in the game engine, right? I mean, another world was <laughs> being built in real time as well. Mm -hmm. um, here you can see, um, well, there were like probably like 20 people doing this, but they were sweeping the sand from the first scene. Um, it's quite a filmic moment. And then the, sec the, the next scene was kind of waiting to happen at the back. Yeah. Um, so I guess for us, I, I guess, you know, in terms of world building, it was really an opportunity to think about... Um, you know how how not to um, scream too loud uh, in in the kind of background as well. Yeah. You know, like how do we actually complement um, all these ideas? Um, and I think from a kind of design point of view, um, the ability to kind of actually look at these references and uh, still really think through a really architectural process um, by designing these spaces, even if it's just the sky. Yeah. Um, again. Other things that I think really nice to share is the kind of edges of the world. Mm -hmm. um, like on the left, you can see, you know, the LED wall kind of ending, obviously, with that kind of cut moon. <laughs> and uh, and also the kind of infrastructure that was making this kind of new world possible, um, lining and stuff. But also on the right, you can see the actual game engine um, intruding, intruding, yeah. yeah, the, the space. Um, so those were kind of really fun moments that really kind of got us thinking about yeah. um, what is that what it is that we do. But just uh, kind of yeah. having looked at this like image here, you know, there were moments on set where um, kind of conversations with like the director where um, you know it's can we play some birds in this scene or you know can we maybe change the lighting slightly? So I think there's really this like direct feedback. Um, you know, you're not working with like a green screen here. So somehow, you know, even kind of physically being there as like a, you know, a person on set, um, you know, you do get this kind of really uh, uh, decontextualized feeling of like being somewhere else, um, especially with all these different atmospheres and uh, lighting and moods actually being like presented to us. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting even by being there, looking at this, you know, sort of dynamic diorama. 
Um, and here, maybe this is something we can talk about later, is the kind of virtual production things that are happening right now, fueled mainly by Epic Games. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, on the left, you see the set for The Mandalorian, which is a very, very, very high spec version of what we did. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see on our right, on, on the right, our setup was actually very lo-fi um, in, in, in many ways. Um, and, you know, a, a really important thing that was in conversation with Akinola from the beginning was he was like, he, that's how he put it. He wants to do it punk, not classical music. Uh, we didn't have the budget um, and we had to kind of improvise. And um, I think this, this issue of resource and, and budget um, is kind of central to kind of the developments that are happening right now. So and, yeah, yeah. When, you, when you look at kind of information about these technologies online um, and, you know, what the Mandalorian is using or like what even Epic recommends as like a, you know, um, standard uh, setup, you know, for making this happen. Um, it, it kind of actually looks really intimidating, um, you know, if we look at this and di- di- diagram on, on the left here. So, you know, like already for a setup like this, you're going to need like kind of four different crews and companies mm-hmm. managing, um, you know, just the running of this like stage that we see. Um, so I think for us, um, sorry, it, it's, it's really about looking at um, these different um, categories and seeing what we can shed, you know, um, what what are the things that um, are not necessary. Um, and, these, you know, it's actually quite a f- interesting process to like filter through these things um, and to come up with solutions that actually start to feel like the technology is being kind of democratized um, to like much smaller studios like ours. Um, do you want to talk about the setup that you did with that? Camera? Yeah, so I mean, as a kind of like proof of concept prototype, um, you know, there, there's obviously specialist um, gadgetry and like, you know, a lot of things that you can get for, for tracking camera movement into um, a virtual environment. So, you know, by looking at uh, technologies from VR, such as this like VR tracker um, that's right there, in, on, on the right, um, you know, just kind of trying to relay movement um, by borrowing technologies that are not meant for this. Uh, and yeah, and just quickly, just to end, so this is the, on the left, you'll see the, the setup of the camera that we had with the kind of uh, VR tracker on top, which again was kind of super makeshift, actually. Um, and we, we wanted to pair it with this image on the right because obviously as the camera was the thing that was threading between the worlds, um, the important kind of other unifying uh, gadget was the smoke machine because the atmosphere had to kind of like be leveled out. Um, so I guess that speaks a lot to like emerging tech and um, old school tech. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess that's what we're really into. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's going to stop now. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all that B- BTS material. It's really- yeah. Uh, you know, anyone with nerd tendencies will will have enjoyed that a lot. I, you mentioned um, you mentioned you mentioned two things which I thought were interesting that lead me into my next question. I mean, you mentioned the Mandalorian. You showed us that kind of the uh, the you know an example of their world building. You also then said talked about categories and sort of like crossing categories or things being in between categories. And um, so just sort of zooming out for a minute from, you know, specifically that project of of yours, um, you know, over the last few years, certainly, um, I mean, even 20 years, I guess, we've we've increasingly seen movies that feel like video games Mm -hmm. and video games that feel like movies. And yet we still have these traditional categories. Um, Now, do you foresee new cultural categories emerging based on things like Unreal Engine, or are we kind of destined to remain confined to these, these silos? Do you wanna, I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, well, the thing is, it's with everything nowadays, I guess it's a yes and a no at the same time. Um, but I think the important thing that we've learned through this project, having had contact with uh, Unreal and Epic um, is that Actually, it's not so much the the software um, that might push for these kind of like 
hybrid things. It's how it's being used. Um, and it's how it's being used against its kind of own way of, of working. Um, and I mean, culturally speaking, uh, we still see, say, Epic still being focused quite a lot on video games, right? Okay, they meddle with Mandalorian stuff, but they're still the video game company. And that is because they are very strict about how their um, software is used. They are obsessed with this kind of like technical acceleration of, you know, doing everything the right way perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, frames per second matters, right? Whereas for us, we can have some scenes that run at like five frames per second, but if you know if we just use them for images, suddenly it doesn't matter anymore. Um, so like, we're hopeful that a lot of hybrid things will happen, mm. but then it's down to the powers that be. I mean, even if you look at festivals, like film festivals nowadays, there's the video game category, right? There's no kind of um, you know kind yeah. of unifying ground and yeah. there have been examples of like games that have come out in the last couple of years that you know are considered to be really cinematic um and really powerful in, in their storytelling but um for some reason that that never really kind of gets considered as like a, a narrative based film or but in so. a serious way you know? so i think i mean yeah. black mirror is like bandersnatch was like mm -hmm. a, a good example of like how a tv show could essentially feel like a game um and i think yeah just you know looking at how these technologies are actually becoming more and more powerful um, and democratized, right? Uh, you're just going to see much more um, kind of Pixar quality content um, in the years to come. And, you know, people from their bedrooms being able to kind of make uh, feature length animations if, you know, with enough um, determination. So it's not really about like what's technically possible anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, my last question before we, we have to wrap it up, um, has there been a, a book or a film or some cult, cultural artifact that you find yourself um, relying on talismanically over the last year? Um, uh, I was speaking to a literary agent and she was telling me that actually most of the books that have been bought over the last year were not new books. They were, um, they were very well established books. So people were somehow finding comfort in things that they knew already. Um, have there been anything that, that you found yourself re returning to over the last year or so? Um, photography books. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know. It just personally, like I, I'm currently going through a I can't read anything phase, <laughs> which will hopefully go away. Um, but yeah, we just kind of uh, actually went to, to the Tate for the first time in two years, a year and a half last week. And we got um, this big Stephen Shore book and that felt nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was it's this book about small camera works, so the stuff that he does on really tiny cameras. And yeah, I don't know for you if. No, I, I, I would agree as well. But I think, yeah, photography, um, you know, from all, all um, eras are like super inspiring to us. And yeah, I mean, we kind of started off culturally as, you know, being really fascinated by image making. Mm -hmm. And that was yeah. kind of traditionally what we wanted to do. So I think, uh, funnily enough, like a lot of people think that. For us, like gaming comes first. Um, and there's actually very little games that like Anna and I refer to. Uh, like, and I think it's actually like the conversations that we have have to do with like movies that we've uh, watched and and you know like movies like Paris, Texas, and like when when this kind of process of like uh, photographing set um, potential sets and like translating that into into film, which Ooh, like Nomadland. Yeah, and I guess Nomadland, you know, Nomadland is which is like a fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it really just it us, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah. I mean, we're really open. Um, but I think, yeah, like if you if you were to say like what are the kind of key uh, like things like yeah, like Wong Kar Wai movies and um, yeah, Win Win those films, uh, as well as like you know, kind of American photography from the eighties. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank uh, you, Seven Anna. It's been wonderful to to get that. Um, glimpse behind the, 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 the beautiful film. Um, bye for now and um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thanks again. Thank, All right, you. thank you. Bye. So Kuwaiti by nationality, Fatima Al-Kadiri is associated with Gulf Futurism, a geo-aesthetic descriptor 
used to characterize the pre to post industrial development of places like Dubai, Doha, Kuwait, and soon Neom in Saudi Arabia. However, during the pandemic, Fatima researched Al Khanza, a seventh century Arabian poetess renowned for her elegies and said to be Pro Prophet Muhammad's uh, favorite poet. Al Khansa became the basis of Fatima's recently released album, Medieval Femme. The Arabian deserts remind us that the deep past and the deep future are in fact always happening at the same time. Here's the video for Fatima's first signal from that album, uh, and the song is called Malak. It has been directed by Abdullah al Mutairi and features artwork by uh, Turiya al Baksami, a formidable Kuwaiti modern modernist painter who also happens to be Fatima's mother. Can we please play uh, interlude number four? Thank you. Hi, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce um, my next and final guest, um, Sarah Shin. Sarah is the founder of New Sons, a curation and storytelling project from feminist perspectives and practices, which began as a literary festival at the Barbican Center. And she is also among the co-founders of Silver Press and of uh, Ignota Books. 
Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon, Sarah. It looks very breezy there. Uh, it's not so breezy. I just have three fans on in this room because it's kind of like a greenhouse. Okay. London right. houses are not built for this kind of weather. It's true. It's true. So, Sarah, the, 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 the sort of context against which I'd like to kind of conduct our brief conversation is around the question of how and where we seek comfort, solace, assurance and strength when our sense of time became untimed over the last uh, 16 to 18 months or so. Um, so when the future seemed like it refused uh, to happen, uh, where did people and where did you uh, find yourself traveling instead when um, you know, physical travel, particularly involving uh, international borders was something that um, uh, was no longer possible and in many cases that still no longer possible what kind of travel have you been involved in in the last um well at the very start of the pandemic it seemed like a really good idea to think um oh if you can't go outside and uh, go inside when you can't go outside go inside mm. and the inner experience is obviously something that's always interesting to me and much of what i put out through ignosa especially in our diary is to uh, share the practices that we're learning to work with to go inside and to work with consciousness. So for example, we also made um, Deep Deep Dream for the Transmissions TV series, and that took the shape of um, a palindromic series of rituals for going inside and accessing that place outside of clock time. You could call it mythic time, or you could call it as shifting consciousness. Um, we included things like uh, meditations and yoga nidra, which is designed to um, slow your brainwaves down to the dream state. Um, but to be honest, in some ways, the pandemic's not been a very mystical time for me. To be honest, I wanted to numb out quite a lot during the first year and not being emotionally present and being kind of on autopilot is like the opposite of spiritual freedom. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like the phrase from Gaston Bachelard, um, inhabited space transcends geometrical space. So also right at the start of the pandemic, I made this listening journey called Instructions for Living a Life, um, borrowing from Mary Oliver, um, which is partly inspired by that phrase. So I'd say that, you know, rather than going anywhere uh, terribly magical internally or externally this year, I've really, it's been more about learning how to inhabit space and inhabit the present when geometrical space out there or the future are more curtailed and less accessible. Mm -hmm. I do think that there are certain tools and practices and rituals that offer ways of working with time so that you can figure out how to experience its unfolding in a much more present and engaged way, um, in a way that's more interesting rather than destabilizing or overwhelming. Um, and one thing that I would add is that in terms of transportation and travel, Grief is something that is really one of the most transportative experiences. It's, uh, I'd say, temporally uroboric. And sometimes it can make you feel like uh, you're, you are yourself a foreign land. Um, and grief is obviously something that I think collectively we haven't really quite figured out how to process because we're still in it. And you, you mentioned to me um, a text that you wrote recently, which was done using uh, a, a kind of element of chance and the I Ching. And could you say something about that? Because I think this, also this idea of, tra of, um, uh, of visiting um, mythology or, 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 or even the mythology of, I don't know, losing, uh, or not losing, but giving up um, complete control. Um, could you talk about this text and what the process was behind that and what it led you to? Sure. Actually, um, it's interesting that you bring this up because it was just a little experimental text I wrote for Auto Italia to accompany this exhibition called Collective Distance by CFGNY, which is a New York-based cross-Asian diasporic uh, fashion house slash art project. And um, I wanted to use the I Ching as a guide um, because I think that the element of chance or alienation is something that's uh, interesting to work with in terms of time and memory, because obviously this is something that triggers your engagement with it. And it is very much uh, experiential unfolding rather than your preconceived idea 
Um, you know, I will be completely honest. I didn't follow the Ching's instructions 100%. I did move things around a little bit, but that's one thing that was interested to me. Um, interesting to me. And the thing about involuntary memory, you might call it, is something that can sometimes, I think, enable you to tap into a collective unconscious or an archetypal field. So because the artist's work engages with um, a kind of syncretism of um, knowledges and cultures across Asia, I was interested in a syncretism or a kind of mongrel um, of mythopoetics, um, which I found kind of dotted throughout, I suppose, Korean and Japanese um, and Chinese stories and myths, partly through um, my grandma's telling. And that's, that's the other part of it that I found that my memory of the before time was quite difficult to access sometimes. And um, so there was this, uh, yeah, I'd say preoccupation with how we remember in this. And so I was interested in, um, as I said, the kind of mythical dimension, which is outside of an individual memory. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to ask you about the role that reading books and literature have played in the last, in this period of time over the last um, year and a half or so. And I asked this both uh, to you both as a consummate reader, uh, but also as a publisher. Do you find certain titles take on a resonance for readers that you couldn't have um, predicted? Um, and I know that you are a, a veteran uh, event organizer and host, hostess with the most S, um, and uh, some of my most memorable um, uh, uh, occasions are things that you hosted early on in the, in the pandemic, for, for example, with Federico Campagna um, uh, as, a, as a prelude, I think, to his, to his book. Um, so yeah, could you tell us about, I mean, your reading habits over the last year, but also how uh, your publishing uh, habits did, how did, what, how did this sense of uh, interrupted time uh, feed into uh, your role as a publisher, both at both the presses that you work at? Um, well, firstly, thank you. And um, I'd say that my reading habits were erratic, but also really greedy. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I really like Le Guin's phrase, a chronometer telling time on another world, which is from her essay that Ignos published, um, The Carry Bag Theory of Fiction. And the chronometer, chronometer is one of the things that she says she's, you know, lugging around in her big sack of stuff when she comes to write her science fiction stories. And I think that books themselves are these chronometers. Um, they're portals, which is why our books have um, this little cutout on the front. And um, I think perhaps like you, I've always loved writers like Le Guin and Borges who bring into relief um, the constructed nature of all narratives, including the one that says, you know, this is reality and that's made up. So books are, I'd say, brilliant containers of time. They are worlds that enable you to um, exist in multiple realities at the same time. Um, And she also talks about the medicine bundle as a formation that carries and contains So in terms of this kind of um, dimension of solace and what we seek comfort in, well, I mean, Inosa began a few years ago as a project that was in direct response to what we saw as like an increasingly challenging set of conditions for survival. Um, And the sense that the old narratives were just completely crumbling apart. (laughs) And so as I think I mentioned already from the beginning, we wanted to share tools that we personally found helpful in um, developing a kind of resilience that we felt was needed to deal with the massive amounts of uncertainty of this relentless time of um, like too much history, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, as a publisher, we were never interested in just publishing books, but we really wanted Ignota to be a meeting place um, for people and ideas and general weirdness and um yeah for for all these things to encounter each other and books were really the starting point so yeah I mean in the last year we really enjoyed hosting like about 10,000 zoom events including Federico's uh prophetic culture lecture series and 
with his book, I mean, it's astonishing. And he's also building uh, through a podcast series, um, Overmorrow's Library, a library for the day after tomorrow. And prophetic culture, as he articulates it, is culture for the next world, a world being definable as something with a unique time signature. And since our world, which is defined by mostly a westernized modernity, um, is ending, um, how do you create culture? How do you publish books that can cross over into the next one? Mm -hmm. um, just to keep on, um, you know, what Ignota um, has been doing, I love the, the tagline um, it, that it's an experiment in the techniques of awakening. Um, or as I've seen it, um, it, uh, it, it takes this position uh, about how technology has historically been often indistinguishable from magic. Now, if we think about technological time, it's uh, essentially unidirectional. Processes get faster, deep fakes get deeper. I wonder if technology is instead, instead seen in tandem with magic, or mysticism, whether that helps in re-understanding what true technological time might be. Could you say something about uh, about this sort of, you know, how do we how do we reconceptualize or kind of reformat te technology um, when we start to see it through in tandem with magic? Yeah, I think that um, the issue is that maybe almost not just that technological time is linear, but as you say, we need to re-understand it through a different constellation of knowing. Mm. And that's what one of our books last year, The Atlas of Anomalous AI, was really trying to do. Mm -hmm. So it was inspired by um, Abby Barberg's massive book, which I can never pronounce, Nermosony Atlas, got mm. there. Um, and both these atlases are using uh, a non-linear associative logic, which is very not like the kinds of um, unidirectional linear technologies of extraction that we have, um, that we understand technology to be really. Um, so it's using this logic to explore AI and more specifically the unconscious of AI and how it's development today. So in that sense, it's really uh, the editors, Ben Bickers and Kenrick Alade McDowell were both really influenced by Yuk Hui's work on Cosmotechnics which says that um, technology is always embedded in the cosmology of the culture that created it. So um, since most technologies or the way that we understand it today is embedded in this uh, dominant westernized uh, cosmology, then that's kind of probably why our technology is getting us into trouble and making us um, not very happy. So the Atlas is trying to disrupt that narrative of knowing the world and uh, which means that AI is kind of going off in this very profit-driven direction. Um, and so it includes a lot of things through images and texts, which may seem not like technology, such as the I Ching as a proto-neural network, for example. And the book is trying to emphasize this history really to not show, not really to show that the world is more confused or more fast or more unidirectional than ever, but more that a certain worldview based on, built on a westernized cosmotechnics can no longer withstand its own contradictions and myths. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it does. And um, I'd, I'd like to end, uh, Sarah, on uh, something in your future, I believe in Ignota's future, which is uh, 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 the, um, the fact that you'll be republishing a very um, famous, um, significant canonical book. Could you tell us something about that book, but also the series that that's going to be um, setting the precedent for? Please. Sure. So um, actually, it's not the book. Um, so Francis Yates uh, was a scholar at the Volberg who wrote The Art of Memory. And that book is very much in print and uh, it's, it's quite big and hefty. And so we were looking for a um, much smaller version, something that um, contained all of it in, say, more of an embryonic form. Mm. And I managed to find the text actually in the AA quarterly um, mm. and was able to retrieve it after asking several people for help, including you. Um, so the text is called Architecture in the Art of Memory. And it's slim and it's not fully formed. 
um, it's, you know, how can you boil down all of her scholarship in the art of memory down into one brief essay that was a speech. Um, so we wanted to create a context in which this text could be published and make sense. Um, and we are developing a series called Seeds um, to refer to this um, notion that it's not in full maturity, um, but that there is there are little nuggets of potential. Um, they contain a blueprint, perhaps, or they're fragmentary. Um, and I suppose just riffing on seeds in relation to temporality and time, I mean, they're tiny archives of time. Mm -hmm. They are archives of the future, um, like books, really. So um, maybe that's where I'll end it. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon with your three fans, I believe. Yes, three fans. Thank you, Shimon. Uh, they're, 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 they've been amazingly quiet. Um, <laughs> are they all Dysons? I don't know. Um, thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon and bye for now, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Uh, the virus is rewriting our imaginations, wrote the sci-fi author Kim Stanley Robinson at the start of May 2020. What felt impossible, he says, has become thinkable. We seem to be learning our way into a new structure of feeling. Now, I have certainly apprehended a new structure of feeling as the months, indeed now years, stutter on. It's defined by science fiction from the past, as though everything we are seeing unfold had been written or filmed before. We are now inhabiting those imaginary or alt futures. This new structure of feeling may be the dawning recognition that reality has exceeded sci-fi speculation. It leaves many people feeling stranded in whatever phase of history this now is, hologram glitch, collective hex, or nature's revenge. My name for this new feeling is PTSD, present traumatic stress disorder. Philip K. Dick was the master of a different P word, paranoia author of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which became adapted into the feature film Blade Runner. Philip K. Dick wrote feverishly about the illusory nature of reality. Here now is a clip from a talk he gave in Metz, France in 1977 about change and orthogonal time. Could we please play the last interlude? Thank you is a topic which has been discovered recently and which may not exist at all. I may be talking about something that does not exist. Therefore, I'm free to say everything or nothing. I can hardly make an error if there is no such thing as orthogonal time. Orthogonal or right angle time is the topic of my speech. We are accustomed to supposing that all change takes place along the linear time axis from past to present to future. The present is an accrual of the past and is different from it. The future will accrue from the present on and be different yet. That an orthogonal or right angle time axis could exist, a lateral domain in which change takes place, processes occurring sideways in reality, so to speak, this is almost impossible to imagine. How would we perceive such lateral changes? What would we experience? What clues, if we are trying to test out this bizarre theory, should we be on the alert for? In other words, how can change take place outside of linear time at all, in any sense, to any degree? Let me present you with a metaphor. Let us say that there exists this very rich patron of the arts. Every day on the wall of his living room above his fireplace, his servants hang a new picture, each day a different masterpiece, day after day, month after month, each day the used one is removed and replaced by a different and new one. I shall call this process change along the linear axis. But now let us suppose the servants temporarily running out of new replacement pictures. What shall they do in the meantime? They can't just leave the present one hanging. Their employer has decreed that perpetual replacement, that is to say changing the pictures, is to take place. So they neither allow the current one to remain, nor do they replace it with a new one. 
Instead, they do a very clever thing. When their employer is not looking, the servants cunningly alter the picture already on the wall. They paint out a tree here. They paint in a little girl there. They add this. They obliterate that. They make the same painting different and in a sense new. But as I'm sure you can see, not new in the sense of replacing it. The employer enters his living room after dinner, seats himself facing the fireplace, and contemplates what should be, according to his expectations, the new picture. What does he see? It certainly isn't what he saw previously, but also it isn't somehow, and here we must become very sympathetic with this perhaps somewhat stupid man, because we can virtually see his brain circuit striving to understand. His brain circuits are saying, yes, it is a new picture. It is not the same one as yesterday. But also it is the same one, I think. I feel on a very deep intuitive basis. I feel that somehow I've seen it before. I seem to remember a tree, though, and there is no tree. Now, perhaps if we extrapolate from this man's perceptual mentational confusion, to the theoretical point I was making about lateral change, you can get a better idea of what I mean. I mean, perhaps you can, to at least a degree, see that although what I'm talking about may not exist, my concept may be fictional, it could exist. It is not intellectually self-contradictory. Contemplating this possibility of a lateral arrangement of worlds, a plurality of overlapping Earths along whose linking axis a person can somehow move, can travel in a mysterious way from worse to fair to good to excellent. Contemplating this in theological terms, perhaps we could say that herewith we suddenly decipher the elliptical utterances which Christ expressed regarding the kingdom of God, specifically where it is located. He seems to have given contradictory and puzzling answers. But suppose, just suppose for an instant, that the cause of the perplexity lay not in any desire on his part to baffle or to hide, but in the inadequacy of the question. My kingdom is not of this world, he is reported to have said. The kingdom is within you, or possibly it is among you. I put before you now the note. And welcome back, everybody. Um, that was the great Philip K. Dick. I managed to interv interview uh, an equally great uh, sci-fi writer, Ted Chang, uh, last year. And I asked him uh, also about change and speculation. And he told me this, quote, what's different about the current moment is that we are conscious of how hard it is to predict the future. Before 9-11, people thought they knew what the next decade or two would look like. They did not. I don't think any predictions people make now will turn out to be less accurate than the predictions made during the first half of 2001. What's different is that now they are much less confident when they make them. The future has always been uncertain, but now we recognize it. Ted Chang also added that, quote, fiction helps us make sense of our lives. It offers a shape to the shapelessness of real events, end quote. So I hope that some of the last two hours provided you with shaping the shapelessness of our recent and present real events. I want to thank from the bottom of my heart all my brilliant guests, uh, all of you for tuning in, and also, once again, the amazing team, including Tom, who you've not seen, but who's been the wizard behind everything, working so seamlessly. Uh, thank you all so much. From the long present, this is me, Chumont Basar, with a very, very short goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>